All right, so we have with us today, Miles Thomas. Miles, welcome to Black Economics TV. You're gonna tell us all about your life and how you are helping people. And I'm sure some people watching will wanna get in touch with you afterwards. Thank you for doing this interview. And thank you for welcoming me. And it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you in your company. So thank you very much. Okay. Well, Miles is a master investor in stock shares and uh, other matters. And he's gonna tell us about his life, how he got started, what his career was before he got into what he's doing now and uh, how he helps people. So Miles, let's go back to the beginning. Tell us about your childhood, your, your development and your aspirations when you were younger. Okay, if I go back to my childhood, I was born in England to Jamaican parents and um and my parents were very am, ambitious for their children mother was a christian father thought that was something he didn't want to get involved in and um and i believe when i was about one years old my mother um joined an organization called the jehovah's witnesses and so i kind of grew up with that particular um window into christianity let's say um i must have been about 14 years old when i had this ambition to be a musician and so the elders we call them the elders the elders in that particular denomination they were trying to discourage me telling me that there was wild women and drugs <laughs> and all kinds of stuff that would kind of lead me astray now, the drugs and the alcohol I wasn't interested in, but the wild women, I thought, hmm, I, I let me meet some of those wild women. I what know. Are they like? <laughs> I'm driving you in that direction. That's not a good way to put off somebody, is it? But I was about 14 at the time. Anyway, so I decided, you know what? I love, I, I, music was in my spirit. I loved music too much for, to, for anyone to kind of put me out of it. You know, you know, it's like when you're in love with someone, it's difficult for someone to tell you that they're not right for you. You have to learn that for yourself. And that was with me for music. So um, I just went the path of music and I said, if I've got to choose between religion and music, well, religion is going to lose that, that, that argument. And so I went down the road of just going into music and my passion there. My mother, my mother's heart was broken because, you know, I was her eldest son. And, you know, for a time she couldn't understand why I just didn't want to go back anymore. So I'm now a so that's about 14. Then I get to about age 18, 19, and I start my family. I start my family when I was 19 years old. And at the time, I wasn't getting enough, I wasn't getting enough regular work from, from session work and studio work. And so my, my then missus said to me um, that I should try another career. And and, and, and I was actually studying, I was at a college studying studio engineering. So I was already doing electronics and I, was, and I did initially telecommunication, HND telecommunication, then I switched to electronics. And that was a hobby of mine, by the way. Electronics was a hobby of mine, literally from childhood. So in my teenage years, I'll be making little things and buying these magazines where you can do it, you know, just make little gadgets. And that was my, my little hobby. And so the idea of going into electronics was just a natural fit for me. Anyway, so again, I was leading towards um, going towards studio work and um, my missus put into the idea into my head, why don't you become an accountant like her cousin? Because they make good money. And, you know, my, 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 my small family at the time needed money. And I thought, OK, well, it is steady work. Musician work is not, as, not that steady. So I decided to just go into accountancy. I had no idea what I was, decided, what I was, what I was agreeing to. But I just said, okay, I'll do it. I'm good at maths, I'll just do it. And before you know it, I um, get a job. In fact, in the very same studio that I was a musician in, they had an opening for a bookkeeper. So I, I became the bookkeeper for the studio. Oh, wow. And um, obviously they knew me already. So it was, a, it was an easy fit. And so when the, 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 the bookkeeper who was leaving, um, I told them I'd done a course in bookkeeping. She said, okay, well, come, I'll show you, I'll show you the ropes. And so when she kind of showed me the ropes, she basically told the bosses, look, you know, Mars is up to speed, let him do it. And so it was a, it was just one of those ones I just fit in naturally. I was there for about, I was doing that for about maybe seven months, eight months. And then the opening came up in GLC, you know, the defunct um, Greater London Council. And um, 
So I applied for the job and I got the job. And what was interesting is that now I still had a commitment to the studio because they needed me to the bookkeeping. So I said, okay, I'm going to change my hours. So I'm going to work nine till five for the GLC. I'm going to work six until 10 for the studio. Wow. And so literally I had a nine until 10, I had two jobs going on at the same time. Wow. And because I, like I said, I knew, I knew the studio guys from a long time. So they were very happy to be flexible with me. And as wow. long as I got the work done, they didn't really mind when I did it. And um, so that was how that worked out. So I had two jobs. And then from there, when the GOC was abolished in 1985, um, I took another accounting job with the hospital across the road, St. Thomas's Hospital, across the road from Parliament. And I worked there for six years. And then from there, I got promoted and went to the Great Ormond Street Hospital. And I was the head of cost accounting there for about six years. And then and then I basically decided that I wanted to um, do an MBA. And so I, I took time out, sabbatical, did a uh, study for the MBA. And literally about maybe six months into it, I realized this is not me. I don't, this is, I'm not learning anything because I already studied accounting. I already, you know, and, I, and, I'm re and I wasn't really after a qualification. What I was after was cutting edge knowledge. I just wanted to be really sharp and you know, in the forefront of what was going on technologically at the time. And so I thought the MBA, well, once I started the MBA, I knew that wasn't what, it wasn't going to give me what I wanted. And I came across a, I went to a seminar by a man called Tony Robbins in the November, December of 96, I believe, 96. And, you know, he'd done something called Unleash the Power Within. And it's really mostly about, psychology and it's about personal development and I was completely blown away and I'd been reading stuff about him beforehand so I knew who he was before I went to the, the seminar but once I went there he just blew me away and he was offering to do financial education so for, but you could call it financial um, it was the mastery university program and so it was financial mastery it was psychological work and it was um, just 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 recentering yourself and, and personal development and so I decided I was going to dump the MBA and go to America and spend a year in America with a Tony Robbins uh, mastery program wow. and, I, and I can honestly tell you the minute I touched touched ground in in America I knew that I'd made the right decision because wow. I was literally you know on the edge of my seat of learning whereas before I was bored because I'd what I, what I was doing in the MBA, I already covered in my accounting qualifications. This was brand new stuff. I'd never wow. done psychology before. So I'm on the edge of my seat with psychology. I'm beginning to understand, you know, the human dynamics. And then I thought, okay, so that's why my relationship with my missus broke up because I didn't have these skill sets, <laughs> this understanding and this sensitivity. And so it opened my mind in terms of how you can navigate who you are in the world and not ruffle too many people's feathers because mm. I was so ambitious and I was so driven. I was a bit harsh with people. And so if you got in my way, I kind of was rough with you a little bit and I was a bit aggressive. And so that didn't really help me to make friends in the career, <laughs> in my career world, unless you were like me, obviously very aggressive and driven. If you, unless you were like that already, you wouldn't, you know, you, you'd have thought, what's wrong with this man? You know, take it easy, man. Go and have a, you have a pint. And when the guys at work, believe it or not, when they would finish work around five, six o'clock, they're in the pub. Mm. For me, going to pub was a waste of time. I wanted to work because mm. I was literally a workaholic. I don't know. In fact, I, got, I became a workaholic because my dad was a workaholic because I saw my dad just literally were all hours under the sun. And so I just thought that was normal. Mm. Mm. I thought it was normal. And I loved what I was doing. So um, going into work and solving problems and fixing things, I mean, I was just in my element. I loved it. So even though my hours was nine to five, I used to work until 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Mm. I, became, I became famous in Great Ormond Street because I worked longer hours than the doctors. And in those wow. days, the doctors used to work 70 hours a week, 80 hours a week. And I, I worked longer than them. So yeah. I was famous amongst that little, you know, that little uh, group there. And even the security guy was saying, why is this madman doing here at 10 o'clock at night? And, you know, I loved it. Like I said, I loved it. I had a small team. I had a challenge. And the challenge was literally growing me and stretching me. And in the process of 
doing, and I basically I was putting together a price list for the NHS or for, for Great Ormond Street. And to do that, I had to understand medical, the medical procedures. I understand, I understand the medical vocabulary and I had no education in medicine prior to this. And the doctors literally, not doctors and nurses, educated me. So I would go to them and I would say to them, I remember the, the consultant neurologist, I remember saying to him, you know, I told him what I was trying to do, trying to put prices together, but I don't understand what he does. Can he tell me? And I remember the first time he started talking, he was talking medical speak and all the words just flying over my head. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I have no idea what he's saying. So I said, okay, stop. Pretend I'm five years old. How would you tell me the same thing if I was five years old? And he literally, he literally paused and he started talking again. I said, okay, I get it now. I get it. And so I had to literally make them talk to me as I was five. Mm. And then once I did that, then I understood the concepts, the vocabulary, and that took time almost to get it all together, but I understood the concept of vocabulary. And then once I did that, I was able to then put my financial skills onto the medical protocols and put together the price list. So that, that took me about a year to do all of that. Mm. But in the process of doing that, there were so many problems and hurdles I had to overcome, which was mostly IT based because the IT infrastructure wasn't, wasn't robust enough to cover the whole area of what I wanted to do. And as a consequence of me solving the problems that I had to solve for my job, I ended up basically creating a blueprint for the IT system, for the whole, set, for the whole hospital. Oh, wow. And guess what they did? They literally took my blueprint and spent one million pounds putting my system into the whole hospital. So the hospital went from what they call the patient administration system to the patient information management system. And the PIM system was my blueprint. Wow. And so that, so that was my legacy to Great Ormond Street's um, IT infrastructure. Now, I must admit, the director of IT hated me at the time. But why? Because, what, because in doing my job, I uncovered the fact that he wasn't completely on top of all the IT for the whole hospital, which is that, that was his job. And I exposed holes and errors in the system because his focus was here, but he didn't have a now wider focus. And so as a consequence of that, um, you know, he kind of didn't like me because I kind of, I made the directors question him about his competence. And so he kind of didn't like that. Mm -hmm. Long story short, um, he ended up implementing my idea anyway. And once he implemented it, he got the credit for implementing my idea. And so the day he was leaving, that was when he kind of came up to me in the pub when he was leaving doing, and then he basically wanted to make friends with me. But prior to that, he hated me because I kind of exposed him to be not on top. And you know what's really funny? When he left, you know why? He, you know what he left? He left to go and do an MBA. He decided he'd need not an, an MSc in, in, in IT and more, more um, just, just learn more. Because um, there was this guy who was an accountant, you know, basically literally redesigned the IT system with something that he should have done. And so he goes away and gets more education. Now, and the question is, how is it me with accounting background could do that? Remember I told you, I was an engineer before I became an accountant. Mm. So, so I already had engineering thinking. I knew how systems worked. Mm. And so for me, I could just sit, sit down and think, okay, how does this model work? What's it trying to do? What's it trying to achieve? And how does, it, how does it interface with this one, this one? And because I really had the foundations of, of engineering, I just, and even though I wasn't using it, it was still there as a skill set. Because remember, it was my hobby when I was young. And so I suppose in a way, that's how I was able to translate um another problem in another department and make it work because i because i really kind of had the foundation for that knowledge already so. okay a few questions what mm -hmm. instruments were you playing when you were a musician <laughs> i was lead guitarist in a reggae band oh nice and, and then when i decided what was the name of the reggae band i'm not going to share with you because it was one though that never became famous but oh, um okay what i will say to you Two of our musicians, our rhythm guitarists and our bass player are professionals today and they've gone on to play with the big names. So if, okay. I, if I mention, say, Gabrielle, Billy Ocean, if I mention um, Roachford, if I mention the bass player of that band was our bass player. If I mention in the reggae scene, there's a guy, who, he's a session for everybody, everybody you can think of. He does a session for everyone. But okay. These are the guys in my band. Okay. All right. Memory. So you spent a year in America. What part of America were you? Um, initially, my base was Los Angeles. Mm. And the, the course with Tony Robbins was in three locations. 
one the one part was in Aspen, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Another part was I can't remember, and it was cold. It was a cold location. <laughs> and the third part was in Hawaii. Oh and, wow! And, oh my! And Hawaii was absolutely beautiful. I mean, I love the place. Wow. We were in the most expensive hotel in Hawaii as as a setting for where we were training. Yeah, it was just beautiful. It was a beautiful okay, country. So you came back a changed man. Do you know what? When I came back to the UK, I was literally floating on a carpet of opportunity of possibility. Mm. I was literally a completely changed man. And I remember speaking to my sister at the time, and she goes, "No, no, no! Don't talk to me. I don't want no more new philosophies. No, nothing." Whoa, well, okay. But and also, a lot of people thought I was too full on because I was just I had just so much energy. I was so positive and, and I thought, isn't that interesting? In America, I was just normal. But in the UK, I was like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Mm. You know, I, I was almost like you say both. I was just going too fast. <laughs> mm. okay. But I tell, I tell you the sad thing about it, though, is that when um, I was going to actually emigrate and go, go to America, but for reasons that I don't want to go into here, um, I ended up staying in the UK. And so I said, okay, I'm here now. Let me go and get a job. And I went and I worked in Enfield, a hospital in Enfield. And the morale in Enfield was terrible. The, C, the CFO, which I won't mention his name, the CFO was one of those guys who would basically treat his finance department like the government, like the, like the prime minister treats the government. You know when they kind of do a reshuffle? Where if you're not very good, they'll reshuffle you out of your job and give someone else your job. I mean, I'm not even sure how he didn't get, you know, anyway. You know, but the point is, he would reshuffle you, and everyone was fear, afraid of him. And he literally ruled his department through fear. Mm. And I remember going there, and like, remember I told you I was floating on another level, and I saw it all. And remember, I studied psychology by this time, and I studied. I saw what's going on. I thought, I'm not having none of this. No, nah, man, I'm gonna just do my thing. And so, literally, I saw his way of managing, and I just thought, no, I don't agree with it. You don't. The best way to manage people isn't to literally beat them every day with a stick and expect them to be brilliant. I mean, it can work for some personality types, but not for everybody. And it had the effect of making everyone miserable going to work. And I was just, I would go in there, fix problems, solve problems. And I remember even one day, I shouldn't say this, but I'll tell you, one day, the lady who I was working for, because I kind of went there with a temp initially, and the lady I was working for, her job is what I used to do at Great Ormond Street. So literally, I knew her job because I used to do it. And, um, and there was a time when she was in some serious problems when management decided to basically bully her. And so she started to lose her confidence. And she was very, very, very competent. I liked her a lot because I thought she was very good. Right? I remember I did her job because I knew I could see myself what she was about. And I thought she was really competent. She was really good. But when management started to just bully her, she started to lose her confidence. And... I decided that I was going to just absolutely support her. I didn't believe the way management ran this show. I didn't believe in it. And I remember saying to her, look, you know what? I'm going to make you look good. And she remember she said to me, what do you mean? Who have you told this to? I goes, look, relax, relax. I'm on your side. I'm going to make you look good. Just watch. And essentially, anything, anything I knew, I would make sure that she would get the credit for it. I would do the work and she would get the credit for it. And I'll just boost her up. And as a consequence of, of that process, um, when she did eventually get pushed out, um, she literally said to me, look, Miles, I'm gonna tell you something. Management don't like you, <laughs> which I kind of knew. And they're, gonna, and they're ganging up for you. And they wanted to get her out of the way so they can deal with me directly. And, and I said, well, look, you, for them to sack me, they have to basically prove I'm incompetent. How are they going to do that? They need, my, they need my cooperation for that. And the only way they're going to do that is to undermine my confidence. And I said, I don't think that's possible. Anyway, so cut a long story short, they would do things like, oh, one story, and this happened every single day for a time. They would give me a job to do, and they'll say something like, oh, can you do this five-minute job? Five-minute job. And I would look at it, and I think, this is not a five-minute job. It's going to take at least four or five hours. And I'll say, okay, no problem. And so and they would give it to me at like maybe five in the evening, a five minute job, five in the evening, right? And this literally went on every day for months, a five minute job and five in the evening, they would give me the job. Anyway, so I said, okay, looked at it. I thought, okay, I, so I can see what this is. And so I would, because I lived in the area, I lived in Enfield. 
So I said, okay, so what I'll do, I'd go home, have something to eat, and I'd come back to the office around seven o'clock. And I'll stay there till about maybe two in the morning, and I'd finish the job. I'd put, I'd, I'd write the report up, I'd put the report inside my drawer, hide it in the drawer, and then I'd go home, because I'm only around the corner, I'd go home, and then next day, she started at eight o'clock, I started at nine. So the next day, I'd come in, and I'd just pretend not, like, like nothing happened. So I'd carry on working. She'd go, oh, that report I gave you, um, you know, did, did, did you get to finish it? I'd go, oh, yeah. So I'd pull it out from under the drawer, I'd give it to her, and she'd look at it and goes, how long did this take you? I said, only five minutes. And literally, you know, that happened literally month after month after month, right? And what they were trying to do is just get rid of me, get rid of me. Now, what caused all of that? I had, I locked horns with a particular, with the, 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 the deputy director of finance. And he was a bit of a guy who just didn't like people who looked like me. Let me just say those words. He was old school. He didn't, look, he didn't like people who looked like me. And he just thought it was kind of just fun to have little digs all the time. And I thought, look, I'm not having this. So I, one day I approached him and I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a book with you. And I gave him a book on Malcolm X. I said, just read this and then let's have a conversation. Let's read it. Anyway, he came back and said, oh, the only reason why Malcolm X didn't like black people is because his mum was white. And I thought, whoa, if that's all you got from the book, I can't talk to you. Anyway, so I decided I'm going to pick on him. I shouldn't say this, but I did. I'm going to pick on him. He's, he's my boss, by the way, but I'm going to pick on him. And so what happened is that he was a golfer, keen golfer. And guess who won the, um, the, the Open Championship uh, the very, for the very first time? A guy called Tiger Woods. And I, said, and I, I, I can't play golf at all to save my life. But I go and say to him, oh, by the way, you know, that fellow called Tiger Woods, isn't he brilliant? Bigging him up, bigging him up, right? <laughs> and, 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 I, and it would irritate him because he doesn't like <laughs> black people, right? Yeah. And then, and he supported a, a team called Chelsea, Chelsea Football Club. And at that time, Rude Hullet, the black Dutch player, was the manager for, for Chelsea. So I'd be bigging up Rude Hullet. Yeah, man, your team's great. Chelsea's great. Got a great manager, you know? And, um, and I would just get under his skin and wind him up. And I remember one time he said to me, Miles, you know what? When you first came here, you had a fantastic future ahead of you. But, but you had, and all that's behind you now. That's all behind you. <laughs> now, the reason why I kind of didn't care about that, because I didn't see my, my future in the NHS. Um, and I was only just waiting to kind of just become an entrepreneur and go off and do my own thing. So, and, and on the side, I was doing property investing. And on the side, I was doing stock market investing. So, I, and I was making more money on the side than I was in my job. So I kind of didn't really have a concern about whether or not they could undermine me economically because I know they could I knew they couldn't. Mm. And so they, they had no leverage on me, no power on me. And secondly, I didn't see my future in the NHS. Yeah. So yeah. You know, it was only a matter of time before I left anyway. And so, um, and, but I did make myself a promise that I would never work for anyone again after that. Never yeah. do it. When did you first start investing? In I started yeah. investing... The very first time I invested was about 1989, if I'm not mistaken, around 1989. And I literally, um, I read um, an article in the newspaper. The newspaper was the Financial Times. And it was talking about a man called Martin Sorrell. And Martin Sorrell um, started a company called WPP. And WPP was an advertising company. And prior to that, Martin Sorrell was an accountant. And he worked for Saatchi and Saatchi. And so when I read his story, um, I, and because of the big spread on him in the Financial Times at the time, I looked into him and I thought, you know what? And his company was in trouble, by the way. And I thought, you know what? I think this man can, can actually you know, re rescue his company because he's got the skill sets necessary. So, so when, when companies go into trouble, they normally bring in accountants to do the forensic stuff and whatever. And he had that skill set. So I thought, if this company is going to survive, the man who, the man who is a CEO already has the skill sets to pull it off. And so I followed his career very, very closely. And, um, and anyway, his share price went from, I think, maybe 20 pounds all the way down to about maybe 17p. And then went from what? 17p. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 17p, WPP. It was this in the early, early 90s. 
late 80s, around that time. Anyway, so actually, no, it wasn't 1989. It was in the early 90s. And, and it went on 17p. And like I said, he was, he was about to go bankrupt. And I just thought, you know what? After researching him, I maybe spent maybe about, two, about a month researching this guy. I knew as much about him as his wife did. That's how much I knew about him by the time I, I finished reading up on him. Um, the share price went from 17p. When I, and this is why I made this decision. I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy the shares now because I, I, I trust him. And he's just got the skill set. Went from 17p to about maybe 25p. And I, and I looked at the percentage growth and thought, oh my God, I can have made a whole heap of money. And so I eventually jumped in around kind of 27, 28p. And the share price went up again. I bought some more at 43p. And, and, and I, but, but here's the truth, Dawn. My very, very, the first time I bought shares, I was terrified. So I'd never done it before. And I was absolutely wetting myself, thinking, oh my God, I'm taking a risk. It's a lot of money. And then I thought, you know what? Nah, just do it. And but I was absolutely terrified. When it came to, when, when, when I bought the share and started to move up, I now gained some confidence, right? And um, so when I bought the second tranche of shares, I was absolutely just, I thought I was a genius by this stage. It kept on going up and up and up and up. <laughs> and up. I get, the share price gets to about £2.5p, five £2.10, and I sell. And so the, basically, I go from 25p to about two pounds something. So I basically, you know, ATX my money. And I just thought I was absolutely brilliant. So I'm patting myself on the shoulder, you know, saying, yeah, I'm brilliant, you know. Of course I knew what to do. I'm an accountant, for goodness sake. Of course I know what to do. But the problem was I had the confidence, but not the competence. Mm. I wasn't a competent investor because accounting is not enough skill set to make you a competent investor. You need more than just accounting. And so even though I um, did very, very well on my very first trade ever, I have to honestly say that was beginner's luck. Mm. It was beginner's luck. Because when I started to invest in other things afterwards, I had more of a hit and miss experience. Sometimes I did well, sometimes I didn't do well. And it was all over the place. And there was a time when I lost about, I, I forget now what the number was, but it was something like maybe 30,000 pounds in one day mm -mm. and I absolutely panicked mm. I I remember you know I was because uh, because basically I couldn't afford to lose 30 grand in a day I couldn't afford it and um and I panicked at the time and I, and I made a decision then okay if you're gonna do this you have to learn you're gonna have to go and get educated you have to go and my mentality then was Go and learn from the best in the world. Whoever does this, go and learn from them. And if you can't afford them, go to the best you can afford. Go to that person. And that's what took me to America. Mm. And that's what made me go to America. And I studied with a man called Wade Cook. And he was in Seattle. But I kind of found him by accident. Because I was in America already, anyway, with Tony Robbins. And because I was there, there was a lady I met in Hawaii. And she said to me, oh, where are you staying? And I said, oh, I'm just staying in a hotel. She said, no, no, come stay with my family. And so I got an invitation to stay with this lady's family in Seattle, which is the northwestern part of America. And so while I was in Seattle, I then came across this guy who was teaching options trading, et cetera, Wade Cook. And so once I, once I studied with him, he opened my eyes. He literally opened my eyes. And that's when I knew. And, and, and prior, Dawn, prior to that, if you had told me just told me what I learned in that class. I wouldn't have believed you. I wouldn't have believed you because I was one of those guys. I have to see it for myself. I am not going to believe you because you say it. I have to see it for myself. I'm one of those people. So I wouldn't have believed a word of it. But once I was in the class and he actually got us to do the trades while we we're in the classroom, we we're doing the trades. And, and my very first trade, I made 10% in one day. Mm. And my bank at the time, Halifax, was paying 5% a year. <laughs> they'll pay me five percent a year and i made 10 percent in one day mm. i did the maths and i said you know what halifax you're sacked because i can do better than you can so you can't manage my money anymore and so basically i became my own manage money manager after that um and then what i did i came back so i learned all the, you, the american style options trading the British options trading is very different. It's a different instrument. It's not as flexible and, and you don't make as much money. And so what I did, I said, look, as I'm, done, as I'm in the UK, let me become an expert in UK stocks, right? And at the time, I could research anything on the internet for an American stock. I couldn't do it in the UK because the internet wasn't as developed in the UK 
as it was in America. America ahead of us in terms of, you know, the internet. And, and um, so when I come back, I realize all I, all, my only, my most reliable guide was the Financial Times, <laughs> effectively. So I had to buy the paper, read it every day. And then, so I would go in there, type information to my spreadsheet. And I basically would just track various companies. And so I decided, okay, what I'm going to do, because I really want to have a deep understanding of what these companies are about. Because I was influenced by a guy called um, um, Warren Buffett. He was like my, my virtual mentor, because I liked his approach to investing. And because he's mostly based on fundamentals. And because I had an accounting background, I was, I was all over that. So that was my skill set. And so I came back and I said, okay, let me research the, two, the top 2,000 companies in the UK. Done all the research on those ones. And then I, then I kind of realized that the, not all of them were good. And so I kind of narrowed it down to the top 350. And then the, and now I only spoke them to 100. And so by, I kind of got an idea of all of them. Now that took me about uh, just over a year to do all of that research on all those companies. But it gave me um, a feel for the UK economy and who the main players are and what they're about and what they do. And I have to admit though, I was investing in smaller companies initially, but I found in one example, it was an engineering company in North of England. When they went, when they shared, when the company basically got into trouble, they, 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 they were liquidated. And I lost all my investment. So my, my investment in that company went from whatever it was to zero. And so I decided, okay, the small guys, I don't want to play with you because you're not safe from my point of view. And so I decided, let me only invest in companies that if they go bankrupt, it's very difficult for them to go bankrupt. It's difficult. Not impossible, but it's difficult. And I realized that the, the premier division of the UK economy if they go, if they get into trouble, you're going to know about it in advance because you'll see the accounts and you'll see them, the profits going down, you'll see it. And so they won't go bankrupt in one day unless obviously they're doing false accounting. It won't happen. And so I made a decision. I want to build this safety into my strategy, my investment strategy. And so that's why I focused on the top 100. Okay. So is your um, method of trading, is it options? Is that what you do mainly? No, no. Um, what I'm doing now, I'm actually investing for dividends. Mm. Oh. I'm investing for dividends because dividends I can predict. I can't predict the share price in the future. Now, I can do technical analysis and see, obviously, the future to a certain degree, but I can't see, you know, long term. And so anything I do, um, do I'm actually forecasting with the element of speculations because I don't know all the numbers for the future. And I know how those guys do their forecasts, but I, and I know that they're just guessing. They're guessing the future. They're guessing future profitability. They're guessing the, 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 the dynamics, what's going to be included or excluded so in, in their numbers. And so they, they're guessing. And because I understand that, I want to, want to do something that I can predict. And so when a company tells you either between six days and three months in advance that they're going to pay you 25p dividend, for example, I, can, I know when that's coming, but you told me. Mm. And only with maybe two exceptions in the last 10 to 15 years. Mm. Um, when they say they're going to pay a dividend, they pay it. Mm. Okay. And, if, and if their circumstances change and they can't pay it, they tell you in advance. Mm. You're not going to pay those dividends. So it's not as though you don't know. So you can know the future in those runs. And so I go for, I do a strategy now called dividend fishing. I just fish for dividends. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Um, you had calls a little while back to do some research into the people who were in prison, the young people who were in prisons, <laughs> uh, and, you, and you discovered some statistics which are very interested. Can you tell us about that? How it happened, I, and what were your results? I I found myself doing some statistical analysis for a London prison. Okay, and. When I was doing the research for them, I noticed that the, and they, 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 they categorized the prisoners into BME, black minority ethnic, and white, two categories. And in this particular hospital, the two number about 50-50, right? In this category, 38% of the whole population, but in this, our 50, 38 was Caribbean. And the others was like small number for African, small number for whatever the, the various Indians and so on and so forth. But the, the glaring number was 38% of 
for Afro-Caribbean. And I thought, I don't understand how 2% of the UK population can occupy 38% of the prison population in this particular prison. So I thought, how is that possible? And I, and I just went back to my own background. I was born in England, went back, back, went back, back to my background, and I thought, okay, most of the people I know kind of had religious backgrounds. So how is it that we're having, we're creating criminals? How is it we're creating, you know, drug dealers and, and whatever it is that they're up to? How, how are we creating that in such large numbers? Because, you know, I'd imagine if we were like, I don't know, Don Corleone, you know, and we had like the mafia families, then I understand the big numbers, but our numbers were just too large. It didn't make sense. So I asked the governor at the time, you know, would he mind if I interviewed some of the prisoners? And I told him what I was doing. And he says, yeah, yeah, you can do that. And so I got permission to go on the wings and interview. And I went to a, a number of wings. I didn't want to do one. I went to a number of the wings and I interviewed the black prisoners. And I just asked them, you know, tell me, how did you get here? And they told me the stories. And most of them were there for economic reasons. They made decisions because they wanted to be rich. They wanted to make some money. They wanted to get out of poverty. And they just did things that put them on the wrong side of the law. Or they got influenced by whoever they got influenced by. And I'll tell you one quick story. There was one guy who had a baby mother in in a part of London. I don't want to expose his life. And his son had a birthday. And he turned up to the birthday with nothing. No present, no card, nothing. Just two long hands. And his missus, his ex boy well, missus at the time, cussed him out. And she said, you what is this? How are you coming with your two long hand? And you, I don't even ask you for nothing. All I ask you to do is we come once a year with a, with, a, with a present. That's the least you could do. I don't ask you for nothing else. You are worthless. You're this, you're that. She cussed him out. He said he left the house feeling like he was two inches tall right, after she chewed him up. And he decided, that's it. I'm going to bring that present no matter what. And you know what he did? His decision. He decided to go and steal a present and bring it to his child. He didn't have any other way of getting a decent present. He went and stole the present. What happened? He now finds himself in prison with going teeth something. So he obviously wasn't even, he wasn't even a good crook. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he, he couldn't run fast enough out of the shop, or maybe he went somewhere where they recognized him. I don't know what the story was. But the bottom line, he found himself in prison over something ridiculous. And I thought, isn't this interesting that most of the stories I'm hearing, now not all of them was about, about money, because some people have done things for violence and whatever, but, 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 but the big glaring one was, was economic. Mm. And, and I just thought, hmm, I actually understand enough about the economics to actually teach them some stuff. Anyway, so again, I got permission. Can I teach these guys some maths? And the teacher at the time, the math teacher said, yeah, you know, go ahead. So anyway, so I decided to teach them compound growth, the formula, because I wanted to kind of get them orientated to that. And if they can grow an investment by using a particular um, pathway, that they could see the future of where it's going to take them. And if the future was enticing to them, then that would give them discipline to stay with the program. Anyway, so I wanted to give them the compound growth formula as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an understanding. And when I started talking to them, I could see in their eyes, they had no idea what I was talking about. And, and it was like, I was talking Chinese. Anyway, so I realized, okay. And so I stopped, I said, okay, let me, and I wasn't quite sure if they just wasn't smart enough, or in the case I was just using the wrong language, I wasn't quite sure. And so I just said to them, how do you guys make money? And they said that we hustle. Yeah, but what do you mean by hustle? Well, we sell drugs on the street. Okay, so okay, fine. Tell me how a drug deal works. How do you get the drugs into your world? In the, in the, what size package do you get it in? And when you kind of chop it up into smaller units, because you're obviously buying it wholesale and you're selling it retail, how does it all work? What, what's, the, what's the mechanism? They looked at me like, you for real? I go, I'm serious. Tell me how it works. So I want to understand, what, want to understand your world first. And so they kind of, you know, got all, all animated and they're telling me how they done it, how they do it. They get in this size and they do, chop it into these small pieces. And then the price of each small piece is how what it is. And then I realized their dexterity around handling fractions was brilliant. They had a ability, obviously, because they're doing it every day, but they know exactly how much a quarter of this and an eighth of that, how much it is, you know, for, you know, for a bag of weed and whatever. 
And because I don't really buy, I'm, I'm not a consumer of marijuana. I had no idea that this was how they kind of do it. Anyway, so when I realized that, I said, okay, fair enough. I, I see what you're doing. So the next, the next time the, the class came up, I said, okay, I'm going to show you what I was trying to show you last time. But this time, I'm going to make the product weed that got their attention. <laughs> 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 we can we can hear you now and so i basically said let's let's sell weed in this model obviously because they're all in prison still but let's sell weed and then we're gonna i'm gonna now relate this compound growth formula to weed once i did that they got it instantly they, they made sense to them i goes okay now that we've spoke about weed let's take weed out and let's put cds in let's do let's sell some music let's sell music now and do the same formula and they did the same thing again and they got it because they got the first example. And I said, okay, now take out CDs and let's put houses in there. Let's buy and sell houses. Same formula. Let's do that one. And I did that with a few examples, things that was tangible, things they could see, things they could relate to. And once I did that, it, it occurred to me that if I can connect with the, where the person is and find that bridge, then I can talk to anybody about anything. And and, and for me to connect with them was to just connect with what they did in the criminality world. Even though it wasn't my world, I just got them to make me understand their world. And once I understood it, I then said, okay, here's the maps that relate to your world. Now, let me show you that. Once I did that, and I remember what's what funny, what's funny actually, I told the maths teacher what I did. And he said, oh, really? Because he couldn't understand how I was engaging them so, so, so strongly. And he goes, that's it. I'm going to teach them that about we too. <laughs> and I thought, whoa. <laughs> you know, but... Um, but, but essentially, when I saw that, but, I, but don't honestly, let me tell you this. When I saw the 38%, it bothered me. My spirit was hurt and it bothered me that 38% of us, our young men, was locked up and it kind of didn't really make sense why the number would be that big. Now, I'm not saying there's nobody bad in our community, but 38%? Mm. I didn't get it. That was just too much. Mm. And so I said to myself, look, I understand something. So let me see if I can help with, um, you know, what can I do to help this? And I have a belief. Here's my belief. If I see a problem and I have the skills to fix that problem, it's my problem. It's my problem. I'll say it again. If I see a problem in my community and I've got the skills to fix it, then that problem belongs to me. It's for me to fix it. Mm. And, um, and it's almost like God is telling me, I put you here, I gave you these skills, fix this problem. Because Chinese men are coming to help you. Indians are not coming into your community to help you. If yeah. you don't help you, then you're, you know, I gave you these skills to go yeah. and sort the problem out. That, yeah. That's, that's kind of my mentality. And so I said, okay, cool. I understand the problem. Or I understand part of the problem because obviously I don't understand all problems, but I understood that particular problem. And I said, okay, let's do that. And then it just so happens around that time, a school friend of mine had a son who was a teenager and he was a bit wayward. And she said to me, he was 17 at the time, he says, Could I teach him property investing? And I thought, okay, number one, he can't get a mortgage at 17. So where is this conversation going to really go? And then I thought to myself, okay. Let me see. So I, I spoke to him on the phone and I met him first. Then I, then I said, okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. Because I'm kind of busy. So here's what we're going to do. Every Wednesday, I'm going to call you at seven o'clock. I'm going to speak to you for one hour every Wednesday. So from seven to eight. And I'm going to give you information. And I want you to write it down, everything I tell you. Write Is it morning or night? Seven in the evening. Okay. Seven in the evening, seven to eight. And I'm going to just write down everything I tell you. And then, and let's go from there. And so that's what we did. And I literally rang him every, every week for about a year. Mm. And, I, and in that time, so here was my plan. My plan was that I was going to turn him into Richard Branson. I wanted <laughs> him, no, seriously, that was my plan. I wanted him that when his age group's coming out of university, age 23, six years from that point, he would be ahead of them. He would be ahead of them. Like Richard Branson was ahead of his generation when they came out of university. And so he became their employer. So my job, my, my um, thinking at the time, let me see if I can make this young man who doesn't want to go to school, doesn't want to study, I wonder if I can make him be the employer of the graduates coming out of university with degrees. Let me see if I can do that. 
Mm. And so I taught him accounting and I taught him the accounting that not the accounting that you use when you have a little man, one man business and they come and do VAT. No, I taught him the accounting that you were the counters you, you hire when your business is 200 million pounds mm. and need someone to help you to manage that size um, yeah. in financial infrastructure and that kind of I want I taught him that accounting how to do that and so I taught him that I taught him um, stock market trading obviously and the very thing I do now dividend fishing he was my very first student I taught him it I taught him um, uh, property investing and I then and I taught him business and I also said to him that he needs to learn selling skills, but I don't have that skill. So you have to go elsewhere and get that skill set. And so, you know, for a time, um, in fact, so what we initially what we did, we actually ran a little business. So what was the business we, we ran? His mom was doing Avon, right? Because I said to him, you know, we need to run a business now because you can't keep this knowledge as theory. You've got, you've got to do something with it. Yeah. And so um, he didn't have a business to run. I said, well, just start anything and I'll help you. He didn't even know what to start. I said, look, your mom's running an Avon business. Let's help her. Let's help your mom run an Avon business. So we literally structured it so that we'd have uh, management accounting and we'd have um, reports. And every, every maybe week, we'd go back and look at our performance and see how we can improve. And we'd have these little board meetings. And in the process of helping her, we made her the number one um, Avon person in her area. Okay. And so oh, that's amazing. Her, her business blew up because we're, we're now on her board. We're, we're now a board of directors now. And she's now, and we, we're giving her the infrastructure that she could have done on her own, right? Wow. But the thing, I, the thing I hated about it is that me and him saying lipstick and makeup was not really the thing. But I said to him, don't watch the product. It's business. Business is business. It doesn't matter what the product is. The principle of the business is still the same. So let's just do this. And even though it hurt my spirit, to be involved in day one in that particular way. Because um, I hated every minute of it, but I said, I'm going to do it anyway. So I want to show you how business works. So we had promotion of the product, or promotion of the, um, the service. We had getting orders. We had logistics. We had um, all of those things that go with it. And, I, and we broke it all down. And I did reports for him showing how much money we're making, so on and so forth. And how profitable the business was. Now that was that business runs on very thin, tight margins, so it wasn't very profitable. But the, that wasn't the issue. The issue is that we learned how business works from end to end, getting customers and delivering on the service. And so once we taught him that, he then went on to, went on to become a consultant, believe it or not, to fifty year olds. He's wow. now about twenty something, and he's he's and because he's very confident. Remember, he's on the, he's a street kid. You know, doing what he was doing, he was very confident anyway. He's now helping fifty-year-olds restructure their business, wow. and, and and they couldn't understand how is it this young somebody has all this knowledge? What's going on? So they thought he was a little genius. He then eventually, after doing his sales um, experience, he then knocked on the door of a stockbroker. Wow! With no qualifications, they see him and they hire him. Because he understands their world. Ooh. Within the space of less than a year, he becomes the head researcher. Initially, he was a stockbroker making phone calls, getting customers. They made him the head researcher because he knew more about stock market investment research than their guy did. Mm -hmm. And so when he left, they gave him the job. Wow. What, what happened? Exactly. And now what's interesting, he's in his 20s. They're in their thirties, so they've got a decade in front of him, and he's still more knowledgeable than they are. Mm, yeah. Mm. So that, and I thought that was interesting. What's going on there? Anyway, so, but remember, he is clever, so it's not as though he didn't come with some innate skill sets for, of his own. But what was interesting is that um, that firm got investigated for goodness so what, and the Financial Conduct Authority turned up and investigated one. So the first thing they do is check everyone's qualifications, make sure that all you know procedures are, are in place, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And they looked at him and he wasn't qualified. And yet he's head of research and he wasn't qualified. So they said he can't he can't be unqualified managing qualified people. That doesn't make sense. Even though he's qualified by experience, they want him to have a piece of paper. And so the directors had to let him go. Mm. But, what, but what they said to him is that because you are so good, we're going to invest in you. 
and they literally gave him hundreds of thousands of pounds to start his own hedge fund. Wow. Today, he runs his own hedge fund. Wow. What's and what's interesting, and what's interesting, I thought about his journey from some ragamuffin street kid literally going down the wrong road. And when I say literally, I mean literally. Some of his friends died doing what they did. Some of his friends got locked up doing what they did. Do you understand? It's not as though it was a theoretical. It was real. It was his personal friends who mm. died, his personal friend. And even he got stabbed in the process of mm. his foolishness. Mm. And, and he nearly lost his life himself. I went to hospital when he got stabbed. Mm. Right? Anyway, so, um, so it's not a theoretical thing. It's a real thing. And when I look at the trajectory of how he got from that road to where he is today, his mother intervened in his life and asked her school friend to help him. Hmm. That school friend being myself. And I thought, how is it possible that I could have done more than the universities could have done for him, or even school could have done for him? How is that even possible? And then I asked myself another question. What institution exists in our demographic that will take an ambitious person and say to them, we will make you a millionaire, and here is how you do it. And it's, and it's for real. It's not like just, just talk. It's for real. Because the drug dealers do that. The drug dealers say to some of our kids, we will make you rich, and so you can live a nice life. And here is how we will show you how to do it. They do it. But apart from them, who else is doing it? Who else, which other institution exists that says, we're going to make you property investors so you can be wealthy in, in, before you're 30? Mm. Who else does that? Mm. And I thought, hmm, interesting. When I spoke to some Jewish people who I was doing business with, they have that infrastructure in place. They tell the youngsters, they give them a blueprint of how to be successful in business. And they mentor them. If you look at someone like Bill Gates, Bill Gates, even though he dropped out of Harvard University and went on to set up his own little business, he was mentored by executives in IBM. Mm. He got that contact because of his mother. His mother knew someone in IBM, maybe she knew him from church, maybe she knew him from wherever she knew him from, but she was able to expose her son to someone who's a top draw executive in an IT company who literally mentored Bill Gates. So he is not an accident. Mm. This come from nowhere. Steve Jobs was mentored. And Larry Ellison of Oracle, all of them had early starts. And a lot of them starting what we call like little computer clubs. So when they were teenagers, they were writing stuff in computer clubs. I had a similar background. Like I said, I used to look at these, in these magazines, electronic magazines, and make stuff from an, in, the, in the electronic area. So I got it. But I didn't go to a computer club, but I was doing some stuff at school. And then I was doing some stuff you know, with, my own stuff, with myself by buying these magazines and reading the magazines, like Electronics Today and all those kind of magazines, I'd buy them. And I'd follow the instructions in, in, in a magazine. So I, 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 it occurred to me that our demographic, we need to create like either Saturday schools or we need to create mini institutions that will allow people when they are very young to get certain skills. And, and, and what, 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 um, what touched me a long time ago when I was a young accountant was when I was training, I came across a, an Asian guy who was about maybe two to three years younger than me. And what made him, and he was, he was my study partner. So we'd go to the library together and study because we were studying together accountancy. And what struck, stuck, stuck out for me about him is that when I was about 26, he was 23 and he was being headhunted to be the head of finance at 23. And I thought, when we're in college together, how is it you're being head on to be number one accountant? And I'm here in a junior position. What's going on? And then I, when, when I learned his background, his dad owned a corner shop, a little grocery store, a little corner shop in Ilford. And what happened is that the dad, he, after school, he would go and serve behind the till, or he would stock the shelves, or he'd be around the back, you know, stacking the, the, the stock coming in, you know, you know from the deliveries. And then when he's about 11 years old, his dad said, OK, here's your job. Your job is to, the, to do the bookkeeping for the business. And he literally taught his son how to do bookkeeping. And he goes, that's your job now. That's your chore. 
when I was 11, my chore was washing dishes, hoovering the sitting room. Do you know what I mean? And my job wasn't doing bookkeeping. And because he had, he started out when he was 11. By the time I know him, when he's about 22, 23, he's had 12 years experience. And I thought to myself, hmm, where do we teach our children so that by the time they hit 20, they've got 10 years experience of doing something at a very high level. What is, how do we do that in our demographic? And do you know we do it? And I'll tell you how we do it. We do it in music. We get people who are like five, six years old, playing an instrument, singing music in church, okay? And by the time they reach 20, they're world-class. Who's an example of that? I had um, a, a school friend called Ronnie, Ronnie Simpson. He then later became known Ronnie Jordan, a jazz guitarist. I was playing, my mum told I played guitar. So by the, because I, even though I was in a reggae band, I started to, I went to, I went to Goldsmith College to study music properly. And I was studying jazz and classical music while I was there. And I remember coming home from, you know, coming back from the college and I'd say, Ronnie, look, check this out, check this out. And I'm showing Ronnie what I'm learning, right? And Ronnie goes, oh, that's interesting. That sounds like, and he would show me another variation on the theme. He was so far advanced compared to me. Right. And I'm thinking, how is that possible? He started to play guitar when he was six. Mm. He then went to church and played every, every Sunday in church. His dad mm. taught him how to play. Do you understand? So by the time he's now 25, he's got 20 years experience playing guitar. Mm. He was a virtuoso. He wasn't surprised that he was then taken to America and he became a really, really big star. Both of us used to idolize a guy called George Benson, the guitarist, before he became a singer. Just him playing guitar. We were both fans of him. He met George Benson. He was on stage with George Benson. I never met George Benson. I never, I never, I never went on stage and played guitar with George Benson. Ronnie did. Because he had 20 years experience, but he was a 20-year-old. So my, so my thinking, Indian people get their kids to have these experiences. So by the time they're 20, there's 10 years behind them of, of practice. We do it with music. We do it maybe athletics. Where else do we do it? When our kids at age 20 are world-class. We do it in sports. We do it in um, music. Where, do we, where else do we do it? And I, I struggle to find that. Mm. And I thought, hmm, our demographic needs to step up and say, especially the ones who are in their 50s, who have literally 20, 30 years work experience and know exactly how large organizations work. They need to come back to our community with a blueprint and say, okay, this is how this game works. This is how accounting works. This is how, you know, engineering works. This is how, you know, running a board of directors work. This is how selling works. Do you understand? Bring those skill sets back to our community so our 10-year-olds can get exposed to it. Mm. And even if you haven't got time to do it, we can record a Zoom call mm. and then put it out there. Now, someone in another demographic did that. Um, his name is Salman Khan. Salman Khan, not the famous actor, the Indian actor, but another Salman Khan. He actually, um, in teaching his cousins maths, he actually created some YouTube videos. Mm. That's gone on to become Khan Academy. Mm. Khan Academy is something that he started, a little thing for his cousins. It's mm. now a big business, and he teaches everybody. Mm. Khanacademy.org. Um, could we do something similar for our demographic? In my humble opinion, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. and, um, and like I said, all of us, a lot of us are busy people. I get it. But we can spend an hour just recording something, showing exactly how this works, step by step. Show the blueprint. Yeah. You know? Yeah. engineering wise or or social work wise what are the or psychology what are the skills you need and how does it work and what's the insights you get and just just share it with 10 year olds share it so know? tell us what milestone investment does milestone investing um focuses on a specific strategy even though there's millions of ways to make money in the stock market we focus on one thing and that's dividend fishing hmm. So every week I produce a market intelligence bulletin, which tells people the opportunity that coming up for the next week and where, which companies are paying dividends and how much and what's the likelihood of you doing well this week compared to another time. And we also show you 
going back maybe five to 10 years, had you done this strategy in the last five, 10 years, what would have been your chance of success? And we break it all down for you. We also show you the fundamental analysis of the company. Are they doing well? Is the turnover going up and the profits going up over time, which means the share price go up? Or is it going down over time, which means the share price go down? Um, what's going on for the company? So once we kind of go over the technical stuff and the fundamental stuff, um, that's basically what we lay out in that documentation. So we, pr we produce that document and that's available from the website for members. Um, we also have a Monday um, session. So every Monday we discuss the very thing. We, we, we speak about what happened last week and how that turned out. We speak about what's coming up next week. And anyone want to ask any questions, that's the time when they have access to me to answer all kinds of questions. Um, if you're brand new, we have a, like a one hour session in, just before the, the, um, that, that session starts. If you're brand new, we'll get you up to speed because a lot of the times the vocabulary of, a, of, of investing is unfamiliar. And when it's unfamiliar, hearing people talk about it is confusing. Mm. And so we kind of get new people up to speed um, about maybe once every two months. I will do a training session where I will literally just train people. Um, so for about 250, you can have a one day class. Now in this one day class, the first part of the class in the morning is, is from 10 in the morning on a Sunday, 10 in the morning till six in the evening, mm -hmm. the whole day. And it's on Zoom and it's a workshop. So you actually got to turn up with a calculator pen and I'm making you work. Mm -hmm. But essentially the first part of the morning, I'm giving you an orientation to investing. The, the, the just the reasons why you need to do it mm -hmm. and i also give an um, example of the psychology if you don't do it you know what's going on and where did it take you mm. and then I, I show them how poor people think around money how middle class people think around money and how rich people think around money mm. and you can see the consequences mm. now you can make a decision which outcome do you want long term mm. do you decide Mm -hmm. And then I say, if you want the, the, the outcome of a rich person, let me tell you how they play the game. And I kind of go into details of how that works. And I, so I tell them the kind of assets they want to play with. And I also say that you, when you do invest, make sure that you understand what you're doing. And over time, make yourself an expert in the area you want to go and get involved in. So don't have the attitude that you want to make money and know nothing at all. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people say that, oh, I want to make loads of money, but I want nothing. That's not helpful. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to be the money manager for your life, you need to gain expertise. So therefore, in the area of property or in the area of stock market or in the area of whatever it is you're involved in, over time, you need to have the mentality that you're going to become an expert in your area. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, um, so that's the first part of the morning. We kind of go over the um, of reasons why investing works and you and from, and from what i tell you there and on the monday classes you can invest in anything after that you can invest in crypto if you want to you can invest in whatever you like because i give you the foundations for all investing mm. it doesn't matter what it is and, there, and there's two parts to investing there are the fundamentals the react what i call the reality mm. and then there are the technicals which is supply and demand and some elements of nonsense do you know what i mean um that goes on there but I give you the skill sets to allow to understand both groups. And, if you, and the reasons why you need to know both, um, according to um, um, John Bollinger, who invented something called the Bollinger Bands, when you understand technical and fundamental, you're in this little circle in the middle, which is rational analysis. You now can understand. And you don't need to listen to noise that conf that's confusing for you. You understand. And once you get to the base of understanding reality, then, you can make, then, then you're in the place to make decisions. Yes. I have, a, a, there's a lady I was teaching to invest. Now she wants to get involved in crypto only, nothing else, just crypto. Okay, there's no, no problem. So here's what I'm going to, so I said the same thing. You need to understand the fundamentals of those coins. You understand, you need to understand the technicals. So, and even though she was, was resistant, because maybe it was overhead initially, but she was res resistant a little bit, but now she understands the technicals and the fundamentals. If you listen to her speak now, now, Mm. about investing she is a pleasure to listen to before <laughs> she wasn't she wasn't a pleasure to listen to she used to, she used to hurt my head because she would just say things which i knew didn't make sense but i knew she had to learn because her ego was sometimes in front of her but mm -hmm. the point is um it's a pleasure to listen to her talk now because when she speaks about investing you know she, i know she understands what she's looking at mm. now she doesn't understand everything because math is not her strongest subject but, but the, thing, the, the thing about her, she loves money. 
And because she loves money, the, she's willing to learn the maths because money <laughs> is connected yeah, yeah. to it. I understand, I understand, yeah, okay. And oh. so that's basically um, my background, I suppose, and what I do. Okay, so we have an idea of um, what you do and how you are helping people. So I would suggest that if people want to find more about you, they visit milestoneinvesting.co.uk. That's correct. Yeah, and uh, there are courses that you do and the various programs that you do. And I think... Uh, There's also a YouTube channel um, by the same name, Milestone Investing code, sorry, Milestone Investing YouTube channel. Just go yeah. there. There are some free resources. Some of my classes are even there. Just go and oh, wow. listen. Okay. Just go and get some free education because okay. there's some useful stuff there. And if you can understand the basics of what I'm sharing with you, then you've now standing on a, a firm platform to take you in any direction you want to go in. Okay, well, thank you so much for making those available. Um, if people are willing to take the time to listen, to watch, to learn, and to implement what you say, then perhaps um, some improvement can be made in, in their investing skills and in their finances. So thank you for doing that. Let me share with you one ambition I have. I would like our demographic to be as familiar with investing as they are with rice and peas. Okay. If you say to any Jamaican, what's rice and peas? No one's confused. They know exactly what it is. Even though it's a kidney bean and not the peas. But nonetheless, <laughs> when we say rice and peas, we know exactly what we're talking about. I'm saying I want us to be that familiar with investing. It needs to become part of our life, our cultural discourse, our cultural, the way we just are. Jamaicans, I, I, I'm come from a Jamaican background, but I'm, I'm counting all Caribbean, all of them. We're all family. I don't care if you come from St. Lucia, you as Jamaican, as far as I'm concerned. Here's the thing. If we can make investing a part of our life, how we see the world, how we navigate the world, in the same way you see you need to get a job, you need to have a familiarity and a competence in investing. And if we can have it, it's just normal for our demographic to just have that competence. I will die a happy man, Dawn. I'll well, die the, happy. the question is then, Miles, do you have a plan to make that happen? I have free resources. I have um, a little book, ebook, you can pick up for free on, from, from the same location uh, from the website. I have, um, I teach. For those who want to come along, and if you want to come and do the one-year program, again, you can do that as well. We share with you how to make money. And because you have access to me for one whole year, you can ask me anything about investing. We literally, on our talks, on our, on our calls, we talk about crypto. We talk about property investing. We talk about everything. Okay, it's all investing. Yeah. And anyone who's there who wants to know anything about anything, if I understand it, I'll tell you about it. Oh, okay. Oh, I think that's brilliant. Okay, well, knowing what I know now from what you've said, um, we can also talk about how we can uh, promote that and uh, help get that message aboard because uh, perhaps not everybody knows about this, you know, these wonderful things that you, you are putting out there that's available on the internet for free. It's available on the internet for free. And also I do, yeah. every now and again, I do talks where I literally do one hour free talks and I've done it several times with the Nation of Islam. I've done it several times in churches. I've done it several times in business groups in north of England. And I just, just, just give out. Yeah. And, pe and people need to realize that, you know, if they're really going to take this seriously, it takes, you know, a few months, a year or more to really focus on these new skills that you're, you're giving. And um, that takes a particular mindset uh, for some, it's got to be a mindset change, in fact. It can't be something they look at for five minutes and then move on to the next thing. Uh, I agree. But for me, Dawn, this is the truth. When I was an accountant and I had you spoke to me when, at the beginning of my career that anything about medicine, I could be a doctor, I would have thought, come on, you, 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 you're talking nonsense. However, by the time, I remember I told you the doctors educated me, right? I remember I said, what I said? 
to the very first doctor who's a urologist, I said to him, speak to me as I'm five years old. Mm. Now tell me your subject. Once they simplified it, I learned something. Mm. I learned that everything is easy. Mm. Everything is easy. Mm. All you need to do is become familiar with the vocabulary mm. that they use to explain their subject. You need to become familiar with the concepts that, they tr- that the vocabulary is literally trying to talk about. What is the concept? What's the idea that's being carried by that? And then in some cases, you need competence. What you need to practice doing whatever it is they're talking about. Once you've got those three things locked down, the vocabulary, the concept, and then the practice of the, the particular discipline, everything is easy. And you know the phrase, everything is easy when you know how. Mm. So all you've got yeah. to do is know how. And the knowing how has, 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 um, um, is blocked by vocabulary, is blocked by concept understanding. But once those two things become familiar, and then you get skill sets, which then become familiar. Like when I play the guitar, I had to practice mm. just to be able to play a tune competently. I had to practice. Mm. Mm. When you practice everything and you, and you do it for long enough, everything becomes simple. Yeah. And as long as you are willing to just go down the pathway and become competent in your area, whatever area you want to learn, everything is simple. And so I want to leave that message to everybody who's listening to this. Everything is simple when you know how. Your job is to learn the how and go and practice it. Yeah, fantastic. And we and we and we've shown you the how. We're giving it to you for free on the on, on a YouTube channel. Okay, thank you so much. This is you're been, welcome. This has been amazing. Wealth of information there, and you've opened up a whole new world of possibilities. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that, and uh, we will keep in touch. Um, we will look at how. We can offer what you're teaching to a wider spread of people, wherever they're from, whatever they look like. We will look at that and have a a chat offline. So thank you once again for coming on to Black Economics TV. And uh, yeah, we will will keep in touch and maybe do an update in a year's time. I'm more than welcome now. Take care. All right, then. Thank you so much. Bye now.